Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm joined on the podcast today by Lowell Caulfield, author of the new novel, Below the Line. In addition to several earlier novels, Caulfield has also written five true crime books that included a New York Times bestseller and lots of critical acclaim. Lowell, welcome to the podcast. Hey, glad to be here. Absolutely. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your novel, Below the Line, how would you describe the novel? You know, I would not call it a mystery. Uh, I would call it a crime novel. Uh, In fact, the subtitle is a Hollywood crime novel. And the difference between, I think, a novel and a mystery, I mean, I think a mystery is like Agatha Christie, who done it? You're trying to figure out, like, who was the murderer. That's not the case here. These are characters that are doing, uh, you know, difficult things and running into obstacles and uh, the protagonist has definitely got a story spine going that uh that uh you know it's his journey so to me it's a it's a crime novel and do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to writing the novel yeah, I actually had uh, done a book in 20 years. I was out here and I still am in L.A. I survived the hurricane and the earthquake. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and um, I, I, had, I got an offer to a, adapt my first uh, nonfiction book, Masquerade, to, uh, to film. And uh, I'd reached a point where I was kind of done with Michigan after spent my whole life there. I was done with the winners. I said, well... I'll move out here to uh, L.A. to adapt this book to a screenplay because I knew that, you, you know, in, in the film and, film and television industry, you have to network. You know, you can't just rely on your writing. you got to develop relationships. So I came out here and, and, and did that. And as a result of that, I started getting um, uh, uh, doing television uh, pilots, uh, designing series, uh, series television, selling it. I sold a lot of the big networks, HBO, CBS, NBC, UPN, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and did that for 20 years. And then um, uh, COVID hit and everything shut down. And I uh, wanted to roll my experience as a Detroit guy coming into L.A., and it's such a different culture here, and it's so bizarre, into a novel. So that the point of view is really a Detroit point of view in the business of uh, film and television here in L.A. And all the absurdity that one sees if you're a Midwesterner that's been transplanted out here. And I do that through my character, uh, Edwin Blake, who is a... uh, a uh, Detroit homicide detective who gets a gig as a consultant on film and television in L.A. So that's that's my eyes and ears and perception through the business, and then set, of course, in a in a in a crime novel situation. Well, in case someone listening doesn't know, what does the phrase "below the line" mean in the film industry? Uh, below the line is uh, th- there's. There's people, when you work on a film or television show, there's the people who are above the line and below the line. The above the line people are the contracted players, like the actors, the editors, director, producer. They typically have their loan out corporations, and that's the way they're paid. There's no withholding taken out. Those are called the above the line uh, people. The below the line people are the people that are getting like W-2s. They're kind of the blue collar of the uh, film and television uh, industry. So they're like the electricians, the gaffers, the lighting people, uh, sometimes the costume people, you know, it, it, it depends. So uh, that, that's, the, that's the, uh, the term, you know, that I use for the novel, but it, obviously it's got a double meaning because, sure. <laughs> <laughs> because the book uh, digs into the sort of the underbelly of the business and so the corruption of the business and, uh, some of the, the 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 crime that goes on in in connection with it, at least in terms of this one, uh, a couple of characters I have in it. Well, you talked about your experience of uh, writing television pilots and scripts. Did any of your pilots get picked up? Uh, you know, I sold six pilots. They paid me great money for it. Build a great pension. 
<laughs> six pilots. <laughs> and every time, and even though like three of them were like the favorites of the executives, something would happen and then they wouldn't get picked up. Uh, for example, I had one with NBC called uh, uh, High Pro. Uh, I don't know which one. That was Detroit 310. Yeah, that was about a, a female homicide detective from, De from uh, Los Angeles that goes back to her hometown of Detroit to take care of her father and joins a really rough and tough uh, Detroit homicide crew. It was NBC's favorite pilot. And um, all of a sudden, Comcast came in and bought Universal and NBC. Right. And boom, <laughs> you know, oh, who who is this new guy? Well, we better, you know, we better go with Dick Wolf and we better go with like these known people and not go with Lowell. And as a result, uh, the pilot didn't get picked up. The Dick Wolf pilot and another one uh, got picked up and they were canceled in three days. So that that kind of stuff happens that's beyond your control. I sure. had a I had a show at UPN called High Profile. Uh, it was almost like a legally blonde, uh, you know, legally blonde grown up, you know, and uh, a female detective who was always chronically underestimated, or I mean, a female lawyer, and uh, she'd take on these big cases and and typically win. And um, that was Don Ostroff, the head of UPN's favorite pilot. And <laughs> I woke up one Monday morning and picked up the LA Times and said, UPN to merge with Warner Brothers. And I knew I was done because, yeah. you know, it, there's just no room. They didn't pick up anything. Sure. So, sure. so there's a lot of things that happen that are beyond your control. But, the, but, the, but I'm blessed that I was able to be paid. I'm not the only one that goes through this. I, oh, I know. I know. I, I, I was going to say, I think that your experience is not uncommon from what I've heard. Oh, I know. One guy, he sold 25 shows and <laughs> never got one on TV. And I'll tell you, one of the reasons I wrote the book is I got sick of writing for 12 people, you know, because, I mean, it would be the producers and the network people and they'd read the pilots and they go, oh, this is great and all that. And I, I felt like I, you know, art, if you don't have an, if you're not writing for an audience, as William Friedkin says, you know, he never writes for himself or directs for himself. He, he directed for an audience. If, if you're not working for an audience, then you really don't have art. <laughs> because it <laughs> art needs to be shared. It needs to be a community experience, right? And so that's one of the things that motivated me to do the do the last novel below the line. I thought, you know, I I, I want to get it out there to some people. <laughs> See if I still got it. Sure. Well, I'm assuming did you draw on those LA and Hollywood experiences oh, as you totally. the novel? Oh, totally. I mean, a lot of the 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 characters are all composites of people I've dealt with. I mean, you know, what was funny is uh, I had a previous agent that uh, repped this book and and he, did, he didn't sell it. And I, and I changed agents and, and got it sold. But his comment was, you know what the problem with your novel is, is these people, these Hollywood people don't make any sense. They're doing <laughs> things irrationally and nobody's going to believe it and, and you can't therefore follow the plot and i said that's the whole point is how irrational they are and you know you look at a, a book you know one of my favorite authors is uh, elmore leonard and he was uh, one of my mentors back in detroit I used to meet with him all the time give oh me wow. writing, writing that's tips. amazing yeah he give me writing tips and all that and my style is a bit quite a bit like his although i go a lot deeper than elmore did elmore never went deep he just entertained the whole way and um uh uh, what was I going to say here? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, his book, Get Shorty. I mean, you look at the way the people behave in Get Shorty, which was made into a movie. Uh, you know, they're a little nuts, uh, you know, the people in the industry. I mean, the industry runs on fear. Uh, it, uh, everybody's scared. They're scared that they're never going to work again, or they're scared that they're not, uh, yet, that they're going to get fired. <laughs> and it's, I call it the world's big you know, most dysfunctional family. And then you, then you throw in the narcissism. I mean, this is uh, the West side of LA where I live is narcissism grand central. I mean, don't you dare slow down San Vicente Boulevard to parallel park and an open meter. You're going to get honked at like, how dare you slow my, you know, my 10 mile an hour crawl up San Vicente in rush hour. 
So it's those kind of things. And, and as a Detroiter, I've got that kind of mentality. I'm thinking like, what's wrong with all these people? <laughs> but you get Californicated and you have to, you know, you have to deal with it. And, and, and another thing is, is people here are not, uh, there's a lot of smiling and a lot of, you know, uh, you know, compliments and, and things like that, but they're not very direct. Uh, you know, you go to New York and you go into a deli and somebody's holding, or, you know, the Starbucks and somebody's holding up the line. People start yelling. At, what are you exactly. doing up there? You know, get off there. You make it hard to get the hell out of here. You do that here. You, they'll call the police. You know, <laughs> they can't take direct conflict. Uh, I had one, <laughs> this is a funny story. I had a, I'd sold a, a show to Spelling Entertainment, which we then placed actually at UPN. And about two or three days into the into the job, the producer called my agent and said, Lowell scares me. And I said, <laughs> why? He says, he's so direct. <laughs> you know. But so yeah, so all that is rolled into this book, all those experiences. And uh I had a lot of fun doing it. I got a lot off my chest. <laughs> That's great. Well, can you go back a ways and tell us about your original writing journey that led up to you writing your first true crime book? Well, I, I graduated as a uh, journalism uh, major from Wayne State University, which was an urban university. And what was great about it was all the teachers worked at the Detroit Free Press or the Detroit News. So I got, then I, I started as a copy boy, and then I became a, a reporter, covered the suburbs, worked my way up, covered the 1980 presidential election, and then really found my my groove on the magazine back then they had Sunday magazines. They were called the Sunday supplement and you could write a four or 5,000 word story and go really deep into something. And I was attracted to crime because at Detroit, I mean, that's, it's like a crime theme park. It's, uh, you know, they invented carjacking, uh, using youth to push drugs on the corners. I mean, uh, a lot of the great uh, entrepreneurial innovations of crime took, you know, started in Detroit. And, um, so, you know, I was writing these these long crime stories for the magazine and um and then the psychologist came up missing and and I was looking for a first book because I I became a true crime fan myself and I and I really uh responded to people like uh, Jack Olson who had a book out at the time called Son of Psychopath and His Victims and uh, Hugh Ainsworth and Steve Michaud, who did The Only Living Witness, which is the greatest book on Ted Bundy that you'll ever read. And so I said, God, I want to do one of these. And I actually found the 5,000 words starting to become limiting. And uh, so then I found this story that became uh, Masqueraded, Two Stories, Seduction, Compulsion, and Murder. And I uh, got my first contract because the book editor at the Detroit News was the form was a former editor at Doubleday, and she hooked me up with her assistant, who had become an editor, a guy named Charlie Spicer, and uh, uh, and then uh, then I was able to get an agent. You know, getting an agent's harder than getting a book contract. Sure, sure. Uh, but but if you've got an offer, agents will appear. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I got so you know so I that's what started it. That's what's and uh, I did that book while I was still working at the paper. I I, I took a, a a six month leave of absence, but I spent the whole time to leave of absence doing the research because this is hardcover true crime. You know, I'm not rewriting like news stories. I'm doing you know investigative research, investigative reporting, and uh, then I had to go back to work. And I thought, now I got to write the book, and I'm back to work at the paper. What am I going to do? So I started getting up at four in the morning and I would write from four to eight and then I'd go into the paper and I'd arrive at the paper all hyped up on coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody else was just trying to get, a, get awake and I'd write a magazine story in two hours because I was so in the saddle of writing every day. <laughs> and so uh, what, what was that, what was that crime about in the original, uh, I mean, in the first true crime book that you a wrote? There was a psychologist named uh, Dr. Alan Canney and he was a very upscale, uh, uh, psychoanalyst. He had a uh, office in the Fisher building, which is a very prestigious address. And he lived in gross point, which is, that's the, you know, that's the Bel Air of, of, right. of Detroit. It's, yep. you know, the points, that's where all the, 
Henry Ford, all the second, all executives lived out there and everything. And uh, he had a beautiful young wife, marriage counselor. She just got graduated and uh, had her own practice going as a marriage counselor. And one day he takes a trip down into the Cass Corridor, which is the, oh, the it's the bottom and it's the roughest uh, part of Detroit. It's full of dope fiends and hookers. And he picks up this uh, young uh, prostitute named Dawn Spence, and that begins this 15-month journey for him of living a double life. He created a second identity for himself, uh, Dr. Al Miller, MD. Uh, and the wife doesn't know this is going on. He spends about $160,000 on her. She has a pimp named John Lucky Fry. It all ends up with uh, 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 Lucky eventually killing the doc and dismembering him. This is all wow. a true, all, all a true story. Mm -hmm. It's really a. It's almost like uh, I've described the book as. <laughs> and this is sort of the Hollywood way of describing things. Uh, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde meets My Fair Lady. <laughs> <laughs> Because he, you know, he wants to remake her into, right. uh, you know, just as he had done his wife, actually. And, uh, but it, it backfires. And uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a story of obsession and compulsion. And, uh, sure. it, it, you know, and the funny thing about it is I wrote very quick, short chapters. And people used to call me up or write me and say, you kept me up all night. I would, I'd read one chapter and then it. I'd be hooked at the end of that, and I go one more chapter, one more chapter. And the next thing I know, it's four in the morning, and and with below the line, I went back to that style, and I I don't know why I abandoned it for because many of my books, the chapters are much longer, and I hate long chapters. You know, I don't know about you, but if I have to sit there and I got like twenty pages ahead of me at one chapter, it's work. Sure. So I went back to that format in fiction and below the line, and it worked really well. That's great. Well, in terms of below the line, I'm just curious about your writing process because you spent all those years writing scripts, which is a very, very, um, uh, I don't want to say formulated, but it's a very uh, um, specific structure. And and so I'm wondering, um, given that uh, background in script writing, did you sit down and actually plan the novel or plot it very heavily? Or did you just kind of have the characters and dive in like Elmer Leonard used to do? Well, here's the thing is, uh, I, uh, this is a little bit of a story, but uh, my daughter was an actor on Drew Carey's show. And, and Drew Carey was a fan of my books. And he said, and my daughter calls me up and says, Drew wants to take you to Las Vegas to a writing seminar. And I thought, <laughs> and I told her, I says, you know, I don't go to writer's seminars. I, 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 you know, I speak at them. And she said, Drew Carey wants to take you to Las Vegas to a writer's seminar. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, and he's covering everything. He's covering the hotel. So we went to the Robert McKee story seminar. And he, this was his second time taking it. And I, I it, and it was three days eight hours with McKee doing his thing on a stage with, you know, a bunch of people, you know, three, 200 people in the audience and then gambling with Drew Carey at night. You know, it was, it was <laughs> with, with a VIP escort, you know, I mean, it was, it was really cool. Uh, but I filled up two legal pads, both sides of notes from that seminar. And when it was over, I thought, if I would have known all this, I would have ruled the world, you know, <laughs> because it confirmed all the things I was doing intuitively, but I learned a lot of things. And what I learned was about story. What is story? You know, what creates story? What's the story spine, et cetera, et cetera. So that really informed me when I went to work in script writing. And it's no different with a book. Um, I find my character. What, who is my, well, you know, who is my character? Where is he at? Uh, and what becomes his problem? What knocks his life out of balance? And what does it take to get his life back into balance? And that's what creates your story spine. So with Below the Line, I didn't plan the whole thing out at all. But what I did have was I had this, this character that was kind of loosely based on me, Edwin Blake, you know, the Detroit guy that comes out to Hollywood. And 
uh, I threw his life out of balance by the work ran out. <laughs> you know, nobody would hire him anymore until this one producer calls him up and wants to hire him, but he wants a favor first. So that was that that inciting incident actually threw his life to the positive. A, a, what Mickey would call a positive charge, like, oh, I just have to go find this woman and her daughter, and then I have a, I have a whole new gig above the line, right? And uh, that's what I knew. And I rode up to that spot, and then I created my other characters, my antagonists, and uh, I just turned them loose and let them run that thing. But the main thing is, like, what's going to happen to my character? I remember when I did my other uh, other novel, which I which I'm, I'm pretty proud of, called uh, Marker. Uh, there's a climax at the end of that that takes place on the Mackinac Bridge. I don't know if you're familiar with the Mackinac Bridge, but it's a five hour, mile span across the Mackinac Straits. And every Labor Day, they allow people to walk over it. And so, like a hundred thousand people walk over this bridge, and I had my climax designed that was going to take place at the top of that bridge in the middle of this huge crowd. And as my characters were walking up that bridge, I had uh, no idea how it was going to resolve. But they took over. And, That's great. And they did things. I mean, you channel these things. And I know these people in my books better than I know my own family. You know, once you get really dive deep. You know, the, you know the funny thing? Uh, the funny thing, Jeff, is that I can't go forward until I have a name. So I had this cop, you know, Edwin Blake, and I spent two weeks like trying first names, <laughs> last names and first <laughs> names and last names. And I finally came up with Edwin Blake. Yeah, that's a cop. That's a that's a homicide cop because they're going to call him Eddie, but he's formerly Edwin, right? And Blake, you know, you got to have those hard consonants. You know, once I had that, I, I, I could see my character. I knew who my character was. And that's that's true even in screenplays and everything. So there's really... There's no difference really between a book and a screenplay other than the screenplay. You can't, you got to show, you can't go inside anybody's head, you right. know? And I, after 20 years of doing scripts, that was the difficult thing of going back to books. I like, you know, having the guts to go and decide somebody's head and with point of view. And that took me a hard, a while to get used to. And once, you know, to get that back in that saddle. Well, given all of your writing experiences, you mentioned uh, working at um, the Detroit paper newspapers and then writing uh, true crime books, one that became a New York Times bestseller, and then writing scripts and now writing novels. What writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories or novels? A couple of things, okay? First of all, writing is not a natural bodily function. I actually do not like to write. I love having written though. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, that, and I'm stealing that line from Dorothy uh, Parker. Uh, and so you have to first, your first problem is overcoming resistance. Which, and uh, there's a really good book I highly recommend by Stephen Pressfield called uh, The War of Art. And he talks about that anytime we're ever going to do anything as a human being that's going to benefit us, we're going to run into resistance. We're going to start a new root workout routine. There's going to be a lot of resistance. Uh, you're going to go on a new diet or a diet, you know, you're going to experience resistance. You want to, you know, start a writing project, you're going to have resistance. I heard somebody say once, if you ever want to, uh, if you ever, if you're ever, if you want to re-roof your house, start a novel because you'll do the roof before you do the novel. <laughs> and uh, so, so that's the number one problem that every writer's going to have is how do I overcome this resistance? And the way that I, and also inspiration, I, inspiration is, is the biggest hunk of bullshit that has ever been thrown out in the arts. Inspirations at, at the most can give you a couple of good ideas or whatever, uh, as Ernest Hemingway said, a writer's got to go out and look for his inspiration with a club. You know, you got to you got to control your inspiration. And the way you solve that resistance problem and an inspiration problem for me, and this is what I used to tell my students, is is a habit, a discipline. You write at the same time every day. You turn off the phones. 
hey, it could be one hour, two hours, four hours. For me, it's four hours or four pages. If I get four pages done and I get done an hour, I'm done. Or if it takes four hours and I don't get the four pages out four hours, at least I've put in my four hours. But it's always the same time of day. Uh, I find that the early morning is the best time to write because your brain is pretty clear. And if you can get up before the rest of the world gets up, you know, you it's just you. So that's that's my biggest piece of advice is is develop a writing discipline, a writing saddle. And you'll find that you're ready to write every day. And if you don't write, you're going to be miserable. You know, it's like seatbelts. You know, I'm old enough to remember when seatbelts came in, and I resisted putting on seatbelts. But I forced myself to put on seatbelts for a week, and then after that, I couldn't ride in the car without putting on that seatbelt. So that's my number one piece of advice. My second biggest piece of advice is never complete anything in a writing session. Always leave a paragraph undone, I mean, halfway through a paragraph, to know exactly what the next few sentences are going to be or the next scene's going to be. Don't complete it. Don't finish it. Because then when you get up in the morning, you've got that. And I call it chaining. You're, like you're creating chain links. Because the writer's worst fear is the blank page. And like, what am I going to do next? Third suggestion is somebody, I think it was William Faulkner said, there's no such thing as writer's block. There's only dishonest writers. Well, what does he mean by that? You're being dishonest because you don't know what you want to write. If you got writer's block, you don't know what you want to write. It's as simple as that. How do you overcome that? You go out and do more research. Uh, research is the key to me to, to writing. And I learned that through journalism and, and nonfiction writing is your imagination is really pretty limited. You have to fill up your brain with material uh, that you can draw from. So, you know, you go and you spend the time doing that and don't do it by like Googling everything. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a lot easier to Google things, but if you're going to be writing about a cop, if you're going to be writing about a patrolman, you better go out and do a ride along and spend about three nights with a patrolman and s listen to how he talks, what he looks at, how he ha handles his job. That's what's going to give you the really good material, uh, you know, a lot of wannabe Hollywood writers, they do things, they write in coffee shops. <laughs> They've got that actually below the line. And then they they get their ideas about procedurals and stuff like that by watching other movies, which is ridiculous because uh, that's how mistakes are made. And uh, I don't know, is that helpful? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, are you working on another novel now? No, I'm taking a break. <laughs> you know, it's I got resistance, you know, and uh, yeah. you know, and you know, novel writing, the money, you know, in nonfiction, uh, you know, when I was doing hardcover true crime, the money was really good. They'd give you enough of an advance just based on a proposal, so you could go out and spend the six months to a year doing the research you needed to do before you ever wrote. Uh, but true crime is uh, gone kind of the way of the Western. It's all paperback originals. They want to give you, like, I think the best offer I saw was like $25,000. And I thought for 20, I can't even drive down the 405 for $25,000. You know, <laughs> it's the 405 is the big freeway here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, and, uh, you know, you can't do quality. You can't do quality true crime without doing that independent research. And that takes a big advance. So, uh, I mean, I burn out on true crime. I, I, I got into a very depressed state after my last true crime book because it, it, I was living on the dark side so much doing the true crime. I started to believe all humanity was pretty much worthless. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's one of the reasons I quit doing that. Uh, but, uh, and, and novels today, the money just, unless you're like Stephen King or you're in the, you're in the, you know, the, the solar system of the greats, uh, the, the advances aren't there, uh, like they used to be. I don't think a guy like Elmore Leonard could exist today. I mean, he did, I think eight or nine books before he ever really hit big. They used to, you'd get an editor who would develop you over a period of three or four books, or five books. And, then you'd kind of be ready for the big time or you would hit with, with something good that doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, 
it's a difficult game. It's changed just like the music business has changed. You know, they used to give artists a big hunk of money for, to be able to do three albums. Now, you know, there there is even advances for albums yeah. uh, with most yeah. of them. So everything has changed because of the internet. And uh, so when I do it, so doing a novel, I mean, I have good cash flow from a you know variety of sources. Um, so, uh, so, so doing another novel is going to be, it's, it's going to be a labor of love for me. Sure. Well, what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? Uh, I actually do not read a lot of novels. I read mainly nonfiction. What nonfiction have you read lately? Right now I'm, I'm reading a, uh, uh, I'm reading a couple of books. I'm reading, uh, a book about Edgar Casey, who I find fascinating, like the sleeping prophet of the 1920s and 30s. And I'm also reading a book called JFK and the uh, Unspeakable. And uh, one of my one of my good friends is Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who believes that his uncle was assassinated by the CIA and his father was assassinated by the CIA. And Bobby has told me all kinds of inside stuff, which is absolutely fascinating. He's really quite open about it. In fact, if you've seen some of his podcasts and stuff with people, uh, you know, he, he, he freely talks about it. But he recommended this book. And it this book is fascinating. Uh, it really sets the 1960s and the, how much the military industrial complex and the uh, the CIA hated JFK for a variety of reasons. It's a good trip through history. It's very well documented. There's a hundred pages of footnotes. It's not some conspiracy theory book, like a Mark Lane book about, you know, so, uh, so yeah, that's what I'm reading now. I'm reading nonfiction, uh, in terms of novels that I, that I, that I do like, I love, uh, I loved all, I've read everything that Elmore's ever done. Uh, I like, um, uh, Thomas Harris, you know, the silence of the lambs, yep. uh, uh, red dragon. Uh, I'm thinking of, uh, uh, and, and, you know, the reason you, I want, you want to know the reason why I don't read a lot other than reading nonfiction is it's like, if you, if you want to see the worst painted house on the block, it's owned by the painter. <laughs> okay. Because he paints all day. He doesn't want to come home and paint his house. I mean, I'm with words all day, right? Uh, when I'm writing a book or working on a screenplay, it's words all morning, all day. And when I'm done, I don't want to read. <laughs> I want to. <laughs> I want to be experience art passively. And I loved, you know, I love good television, good movies. So I spent a lot of time uh, doing that. Uh, and the reason I'm reading now is because I'm not working on a book or a screenplay. And there's a writer's strike, so this is a good time to kind of like, and and that's where I get my material is reading these nonfiction books and you know inputting all that different stuff. Well, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your books and your latest novel? LowellCaulfield.com. That's L O W E L L Caulfield C A U F is in Frank F is in Frank I E L no D <laughs> dot com. <laughs> It's lowcaulfield.com. I've got some nice videos up there and some interviews with me. And, uh, uh, you know, I created a nonprofit, too. Uh, during the last writer's strike, it was about 12 years ago. I think that was like 2012. Yeah. Uh, nobody was doing anything. And a friend of mine and I created a, a film company and uh, and uh, got it funded to uh, as a nonprofit uh, to do three uh, short films that we wrote and, and directed that help people um, recover from alcoholism and um, drug abuse. And they're not like didactic information. They're, they're stories. I mean, two of them are comedies, believe it or not. And the one that I directed and wrote uh, is like a Twilight Zone episode where B.F. Skinner, the famed psychologist, has got a guy inside of a box giving him an unknown substance, and he has to go pull a lever to get it, run across electrical grids, and he's like a rat in an experiment. It's a lot of fun doing that. So, I mean, I've, diverse, I've, I've tried to give back 
with, you know, with what I do too. I myself, I've been in recovery for 38 years. All my books, there will always be in a novel. There'll always be somebody, you know, in a 12 step group just because I know so much about it. Sure. And it's, and it's a way for people to see what a 12 step group is like, because people think they're one thing and there's something entirely different usually. Right. Well, great. Well, again, we've been speaking to Lowell Caulfield, author of the new novel, Below the Line. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Lowell, thanks for doing this interview. Jeff, it's been a real pleasure. It's been great questions. And you let me kind of go on and on, which <laughs> which I could do. I'm glad. That's okay. That's okay. It's great. Thanks a lot. Uh